Hi guys, and welcome to this Creative Labs with Young Film Academy live stream. Uh, coming from here, which is the Samsung King's Cross space, as, as usual now, this is our fourth one, which is very exciting, where we've been discussing and exploring different aspects of filmmaking, and hopefully, you know, you guys learning some really interesting specific subjects um, that you can apply to your films uh, to take them to the next level. And today's no different. Today is uh, equally exciting. If not, you know, with, with everything we've covered before, this is going to be the most transferable. Everything we talk about today, you can apply to everything you've learned in the previous sessions and potential future sessions as well. And if you have missed any of the past sessions, they are all available on our YouTube channel. So just search for youngfilmacademy.co.uk um, or just Young Film Academy on YouTube, and then you'll be able to find all those previous videos and, uh, and stay up to date. So today, we're looking at composition and framing, which is essentially us talking about how we compose images, how we um, film things to make them look really cool. Because, you know, you, you know, you might have tried making a film with friends, you might have tried uh, making a film with people you don't consider friends, whatever. But the point is, if it doesn't look good, then, you know, it's frustrating, you know, because you want it to look as good as the films do in the cinema or as good as they do on, on Netflix or, or Amazon these days, especially these days. So how can you get that, that cinematic look is obviously the, uh, the term that people um, use all the time. And, and really, it comes down to a lot of basic principles. It helps to have a really high-end camera, but most people don't have those. I don't even have one. But you know, you rent them if you've got the money, but most of the things that we're talking about today, you can do with a smartphone, you can do uh, with any kind of tablet device. We're gonna be using a, a Samsung Galaxy smartphone um, to create that cinematic look simply by applying the most basic of filmic principles. Now, you might remember if you did tune into one of our earlier sessions about the three shots, uh, the three basic shots that make up storytelling, whether that's uh, a close-up, a mid-shot, or a wide. So just as a, as a little recap uh, to go over what that is, and then we're going to talk about, okay, how do we take that to the next level? How do we make those shots um, look really cool? So I said Sam is here today, who's going to uh, volunteer as tribute um, to demonstrate the wide, medium, and close. And then I don't know if you can see, but next to Sam, I've got a nice little table set, which has got all these obstacles to demonstrate a lot of the other principles. Um, we've got some snowmen, which are going to be great. We'll, we'll come on to that in a bit. It's very exciting. But more exciting is, is Sam, because he's alive. Um, so let's, uh, let's just pull up the camera on, uh, on this smartphone. Great. So we've got speed. So we're going to switch over to the video mode. So this is, again, like I said, this is just a very brief recap of uh, our basic three shots of filmmaking. So our wide shot is essentially a shot where we've got the entirety of someone in the frame. So this, you can see, we can see all the way from uh, Sam's shoes to the top of his head. This would be your wide shot, essentially. Um, so we're just gonna record this so we can assemble this later. Great, so that's our wide shot. And the most useful thing about a wide shot is context. So we can see that Sam is in an auditorium space with some kind of cool bus behind. That's the, the 5G bus. Um, so wide shots are great for context. Then our mid shot, which is basically waist upwards, smashing it, Sam. That's our mid shot, uh, is great for any kind of action. So if you sort of moved, you don't have to move, but if you were to move or you were to have a fight with someone, this would be a great shot because I can see more detail of you um, and you've got room to move around. Great, so that's our mid shot. And then our close up would be head and shoulders like this. So that's our close-up. Perfect. Now, if you don't mind staying there for one moment, Sam, because one thing we're going to do, we're going to go into our settings on our phone. So we're going to go into settings. And our first tip for composition and framing is to turn on what's called the grid lines, which is essentially going to implement what's called the rule of thirds. Now, I was, I was doing it just effortlessly without even trying. But I would recommend turning on grid lines on your phone whether you're taking videos, whether you're taking photos. In fact, a lot of this is actually transferable to photography as well as videography. Now we can see that we've got these lines on, and you might be thinking, well, what are those? Well, th these are essentially 
um, allowing us to line things up with them to give them more um, significance and importance. The human, you might think, oh, just if I'm filming something, I'm just going to put uh, Sam in the center. Great, yep, you can do. Um, but lining someone up with one of the lines actually um, draws the eye to it far more. Now, I did film Sam for center frame. However, for the close-up, I was actually lining his eyes up, you can see, with the upper third line. So the eyes are drawn to there. If we were to go the other way, if we're too low, the eyes are just too close to the top of the frame, so you lose the impact, and suddenly it feels like a sh shot of Sam's neck rather than a shot of Sam's eyes. So that's where you sort of want the eyes, so it's head and shoulders like that. And again, if we come back out to a medium, so you can see, again, Sam's eyes are sort of on that line. Um, and there's a nice amount of headroom, but the, uh, that line is really drawing us in, so that because the eyes are, you know, the window to the soul, and, and films are about people, generally speaking, unless it's a Pixar movie. But even most of those characters have eyes. And then again in the wide, same things apply. But then you can also get a bit more creative and line him up with, say, one of the third lines over here, which is great. Oh, there's a bit too, there's a lot of BTS there. Um, which, this is also very interesting. You can see I'm also trying to use the lower line to sort of line up with the table as well to sort of draw attention to that. So there you go. So Sam, that's perfect for now. Thank you so much for your help there. So there you go. So that's our first step in the uh, composition and framing uh, train, which is essentially frame sizes and using those rule of thirds, really using them to line things up. This also applies to horizons as well. You know, if you've ever tried to take that, you know, stunning sunset beach shot, and you're like, oh, it doesn't look quite as good as it does in the movies and stuff like that. That's because the horizon line, actually, when you see it in photographs, is very rarely in the middle. It has far more power, be it sitting on the lower or upper third. And we could demonstrate it actually with this uh, this little scene here. At the moment, this is just in sort of a random configurement. So this is our my little set that I built earlier, um, which doesn't have too much going on here. But, you know, if we were to just sort of stick that in the middle, yeah, it's, it's whatever. But if we were to sort of line that up with the bottom one, here we go. So we're going to use that to sort of empower the table, you see, which is going to give it far more, far more impact. And you can do it with lots of things as well. So maybe... Uh, we're going to poke through here. We're going to look at this 5G bus, which is very exciting. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. That, using that lower third line, is just going to be a far more interesting frame. And I can also, I can line up this third line on the right here with sort of the edge of uh, uh, the seating area here. So suddenly, things are starting to line up, and it's just giving the frame far more sort of power uh, on screen. If we can try and get something else lining up, that'd be great. But you can see like the top of the bus or that border sort of lining up now with the, uh, the upper third line. But again, you can use these just to really give your shots far more sort of power um, and impact, which is very exciting. Now, that's, that's the rule of thirds. It's very useful. There's a few other actual uh, types of uh, weird things where the human eye is sort of drawn to particular areas, but you can look into those later. Some of them will get a bit, look, little bit weird. Um, the next thing that really, if you do this for every single shot of your movie, guaranteed it's just going to look 20 times better. Um, that is depth. Uh, what do I mean by depth? Depth could mean just having an image that's not flat, right? So let's, uh, let's use this fantastic little set. Um, to demonstrate something that would be very flat and probably a pretty rubbish photograph or video. So I brought this, this, very, um, this, this piece of art uh, here. And if I were to just frame this like this, so it's just going to be a texture shot. There we go. I'm videoing that. It's just pretty dull, isn't it? There's no depth whatsoever. That is the literally the definition of a flat image. So that's no good. We could just uh, you know, film something that goes off into the distance um, to, to give it depth. So we could introduce what's called background. So this is obviously our subject. So we're going to go back down here. We can line this up here like this. We can tap to focus. And suddenly, 
Whoa, 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 whoa. That's a more interesting shot, huh? And I'm also, I'm lining up the sort of, I'm gonna call it a spire or chimney. That has got far more presence in the shot now that there's at least background. So that's introducing depth there. But the third thing that you want to add depth as well is foreground. And those are your three stages of depth. Foreground, middle ground, background. Generally speaking, the subject is always the mid-ground because what's in the foreground is often out of focus. So the great thing with, uh, with smartphones these days is that they've got really sort of wide apertures. Um, that's the little f-stop number that you might see in the spec sheets where it goes down, it says like f1.8 or f2.2. Essentially, the lower the number, the shallower depth of field that lens can give you. And by shallower depth of field, it just means whatever's in focus in the foreground or in the middle ground, everything behind that is blurry. And obviously, if you're pointing at something in the middle ground, then what's either side of that is gonna be blurry. And it just really has that, or it adds that cinematic quality, which is exactly what we're talking about today. So now let's try and work out, let's try and create some foreground for this otherwise very flat shot. Let's use this plant here. Actually, you know what? Because it's very gray, the plant, I'm gonna use this, I've got an elephant here, which I'm gonna use as a foreground, in fact, let's, let's do a bit of a range in here. I'm set dressing as much as anything else. You know, the other thing that really adds to your shots, you know, it's, it's as much about what you're filming as how you're filming it, but today, obviously, we're taking care of the how you film it, you know. I think what I'm filming is fantastic, so that's already a head start. So we've got this, exactly sort of roughly how it was before. This needs to come much closer, like that. Let's line that up with the other third line as well. Boom, we're gonna video that. And now we've got a nice bit of depth. Why don't we add a dolly? There we go, we're gonna push in. You can see the movement around, we're getting closer, great. You can imagine that's a person as well, and we can, that's what the snowmen are for as well. They're gonna be our people stand-ins as we construct these scenes. Let's just take a look at that back. So again, let's uh, see this. So we've got some foreground, middle ground, background. The moment you have all three of these elements, everything that you're pointing the camera at suddenly feels like it has intention. It feels like a composition. It feels like a, a, a far more beautiful piece of imagery or art even. And this goes for whatever you're filming, you know? If you're filming two people sitting in a room having a dialogue scene, then that can very quickly become quite dry. Um, an example would be Peep Show. You know, it's a lot of POV. It's just sort of cutting uh, from each other's, uh, each character's perspective. It's, very, it's a stylistic choice, it's a bold choice, great, good for them, but obviously there's not much depth. That's, but that's why that's more of a television format as opposed to uh, movies. So let's, uh, let's construct a little dialogue scene. We've got, um, we'll create, use some of these objects as maybe some background, get our elephant in here. And we're gonna create this object, but, uh, sorry, this scene between our armless snowman and our, uh, and our snowman with arms. So these guys are gonna be sort of talking to each other like this. And in fact, let's, let's run through the whole thing. You know, we've got a dialogue scene. We've got these two people, fantastic. Um, now, what I was talking about earlier in terms of the peep show, in terms of POV stuff. Uh, one sec, let's go back into the camera. If this was my close up, then that would be the shot. It's fine, it's cool. It's at least got, some, oh, that's me. It's at least got some depth in the sense that you've got the elephant behind it and whatnot. That's cool. But we want to imply that they're talking to each other. So let's put this elephant here. Oh, not an elephant. It's not in there. Oh, my God. It's a Thursday. Right. So we've got our snowman here. And suddenly we've got foreground, middle ground, background. Hello. I'm a snowman. Now I'm embarrassing myself. <laughs> now we're gonna come around this side and we're gonna film the reverse. So this is gonna be the reverse shot. 
going to need to move our elephant for this shot. Doesn't matter too much. Now, you might have seen me zooming in. Why am I zooming in? Essentially, you can get a better sense of depth um, or blurrier background if you, if you use a zoom, which is essentially is creating the effect of using a longer lens, uh, which compresses the field of view so you can't see as much either side and really just draws attention to whatever it is you're pointing the camera at. So I, I can be further away and more zoomed in, and suddenly uh, it's a more compressed shot. Hello, I'm also a snowman. And that's our, uh, obviously you can see also I'm lining them up with the rule of third line. So one of them's on the right line, one of them's on the left line. And notice as I uh, spun round here, they stay on their respective sides. So the armless one's on the left line, the, uh, the one with arms is on the right. And even though I come round here, same thing applies. That's what we call not crossing the line. We're staying this side of the scene so that each character stays on their respective side of the screen so we get the sense that they're looking at each other. If we broke the line, let's just pull the camera up once more, if we went the other side, suddenly we've lost the context of who's who. And then if you're shooting a wide shot, as we demonstrated earlier with Sam, I want some kind of uh, some kind of foreground, which is why I've got this plant here ready to go. Now, bear in mind, whatever your foreground is that you're using, it's going to have real implications for the narrative of the story that you're telling. So uh, let's uh, throw these up here. I don't want this red guy. I feel like he's going to be distracting. Um, oh, it's Father Christmas. So here's our wide shot. You can tell because you can see all of them. Uh, head to toe. I mean, they're very short, so you'd hope so. But if we just get a nice bit of foreground. Like this. Kind of line them up with the, uh, with the third line. There we go. So you get the sense that they're there together, which is great. Now, if we were to go through the plant, suddenly the vibe will change. I'll show you what I mean. Oh. If we were to go through here, and again, this is where narrative comes in. Let's have this nightmare. I'm going to drop this. And, and it, we're live. OK, if we, oh, there we go. See, if I record that, now suddenly, because there's so much obscurity in the foreground, we are using foreground to paint in a narrative gap, which is basically saying they're being spied on. Do you see what I mean? Someone's watching them. So you see, you can use foreground, again, as this sort of additional, um, additional narrative component that's just going to really uh, give information to the characters. Oh, sorry, to the audience. That's our foreground, middle ground, background. That's one of our other really important main things that we can do just to elevate our shots and take them up to the next level. If you can find a way to get foreground, middle ground, and background into every one of your shots in your movie, then you're going to end up with a really good looking film. That's a general rule of thumb. Now, the next thing that we can do is we can do what's called a frame within a frame. Now, you might have seen this with someone maybe standing in a particular space that's really square. And obviously, the photo itself, assumedly, is square. You don't see many circle photos unless they're sort of profile things, so it's just contextual. But we could use, say, the legs of this elephant here uh, to frame our armed snowman. And what does that do? Why would, why would we do that? Well, frame within a frame really adds context. So, Whatever that is, is going to, again, have implications to your story. 
the context might be, you know, a sense of significance of like uh, of what it is that they're where they are. So you might not be able to tell. So if we go here, then this frame within a frame, we're using um, the elephant. Essentially, the story here, and again, we've got background. The elephant's our foreground, and we've got a snowman that's at the zoo. How exciting is that? So you can sort of see how we're using frame within a frame to sort of, again, tell that, tell that story. Now, if we change that, we could use maybe go this way, and you won't be able to tell it's an elephant. I'm hoping, anyway. If we could just pretend, <laughs> then suddenly this is going to feel more like prison cells. Now, this has been a very naughty snowman who's sort of in prison. You can see all these prison bars. Oh, we've got this moody red light over here hitting the elephant's butt. I mean, the prison bars, you know? So there you go. So we create context that way, again, using uh, the context to sort of frame, frame our person, which is great. Now, the other thing that we can do is, um, is symmetry. Now, symmetry is only useful, obviously, when you've got something that's symmetrical, obviously. But that's really just going to add some uh, significance and grandiose generally to the space. So again, this is a contextual type of shot. And what I mean by context is just the information around your character. You know, you've always generally got a subject in the film. In fact, what we might do, Sam, if I could borrow you for this bit, would be great. Can we, go, can we go off piece and use this beautiful space? Yeah? How cool is this? So if you guys haven't been here before, it's really cool. Look at this like amazing building here. Like if we, in fact, that looks almost like an X on the spot. If you want to go stand there, Sam, for me, that would be perfect. And this is where we can use symmetry to give awe and power to the actual space. So we're going to zoom out for this. Now again, there's not necessarily depth for this, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the rule of third line. So I'm going to, you see where sort of the floor hits the ground at the back? I'm going to try and line that up with the lower third. And suddenly, there we go, it's just going to add a lot more weight and power to the, uh, to the space. And low angles as well are also very good if you've got a big space because they're just going to give this sense of how impressive it is. There we go. That's our, oh, slip the line. There we go. So it's lining up with that sort of back wall there. And we're really using symmetry to give a sense of sort of awe in the space. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you, sir. So you can see that's great for sort of wide shots. It's not very good for close-ups. The idea of like symmetrical framing. It's far more interesting if we've got that sort of off center. If you line up your characters left and right of a frame, you know, if you and you don't have to shoot over the shoulder. That's a very particular sort of narrative trick. You can shoot side on. Keep one of them on the left of the scene, one of them on the right, as we did before. And we're also going to introduce another thing. I, it's so much knowledge in. 25 minutes, this is mad. We're going to introduce something called negative space. What's that? I don't even know. So, negative space is essentially space around your character that's empty. Or, you know, yeah, well, generally, yes, empty space. Um, so we really want it to be as plain as possible. How about something that we shot earlier that we said was very flat? Boom. So let's zoom in here to sort of simulate that longer lens fill. So we can still get a bit of depth. So even though the background's flat, we've still got, you can see it's far more out of focus than he is. Or she. I don't know what gender the same person is. So. There we go. I'm going to push them back like that. You can see. They're on that line there. Hello, hello, hello. I'm talking to you, armless snow person. And then our matching shot, if we're shooting this as a dialogue scene, I'll bring this over here, just to imply that it's all one long continuous background. There we 
go. Hello, hello, hello. I am the armless snow person. Perfect. I just want them more on the line, but uh, there we go. Great, so we've managed to introduce depth, we've introduced negative space. That's another way that we could shoot that dialogue scene. We've still got background there, so there's still some sense of depth. There wasn't any foreground, you know, maybe we could have introduced like a leaf or something like that, it would have been really cool. Um, but I think uh, the important thing there was the implication of changing the angle slightly. We're still shooting a dialogue scene between two characters. You really want to make sure you can see that eye. So I would have maybe come from a slightly more 45 degree angle. But what I was really trying to do was keep them on their left and right lines using the rule of thirds. And the reason that I was doing that was so that there was a huge space in front of them, between them. Why might I do that? Well, let's, uh, let's take a look at these clips. Where's my gallery go? Oh, let's go gallery. Okay, let's have a look at these two clips. We're gonna go more. We're gonna create movie. Perfect. So we've got these two shots, and if we play them back to back. If you just Hello. pretend that that grey area is sort of all one long background between the two of them. By having all this sort of space in front of them, what are you saying to the audience? You're saying the space between them. You see? So then you can get really artsy. Whereas, if we now do this, let's get rid of this one. Let's get rid of this. Oh, right. Let's add the... Uh, these other items. Let's add the original dialogue scene we shot. I'm going to go this one, and then our close-ups. And then we're going to get rid of our negative space shot. Boom. All right, let's trim this one a little bit. Literally create a little dialogue scene here. Very cool. Done. So it trims that, great. So now if we play this, especially with a shot that we did at the start with looking through the trees, let's see how this, uh, this looks. You see what I mean? Ignore the Start fact that watching. I was moving the plant because it was really hard to sort of do that and video at the same time. Hello. Now Hello. we're peering over their shoulders. You've got that beautiful sense of Hello. depth, but coupled with that Hello. shot at the start, what are we saying? We're saying, that maybe this is a really personal conversation and we're seeing something that we shouldn't be seeing. The fact that we're coming in over someone's shoulder just really suggests that everything we're seeing in the scene is something that's really intimate between I mean? these two Someone's snow people. It. Maybe they're ready to tell Santa Claus that Hello. they just they don't think they're gonna last the year, you know? Um, because spring's on Hello. its way. I mean, it's not yet, but you know, I'm a maybe that's what's going on. But there you go, that's an example of not just what foreground, middle ground, background mean, or, what just, uh, or just how to use depth, but how to use it with artistic and narrative intent. And that's what I was saying at the start, or midway through when I remembered to say it, is that it's as much about what you're framing as it is how you frame it. So it's the, it's the two things working side by side. But you wanna make sure that your, your video artistry is, uh, is doing everything it can to support what it is you're putting on screen. And that's really the crux of what we're doing today. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. I hope this was obviously a lot of information in a short space of time. Um, but you can go back, you can re-watch it, you can share it with your friend, with your nan, whatever you wanna do. And, uh, and stay tuned for, for more uh, live streams from Young Film Academy here at Samsung uh, King's Cross. Next week we're running a, another workshop in person, um, so you can get tickets for that online, and uh, that's going to be covering action filmmaking and uh, stunts. So we're going to take a look at how you shoot stunts safely, including throwing punches, and also talk about some of these principles again and getting a chance to practice them. So using foreground, middle ground, background, but in order to um, fake stuff that's not actually happening, like swinging a punch and stuff. 
so thanks for joining us, guys, and we'll see you soon. thank you very much.